Antonia Juhas is an activist, author, and policy analyst. She is a fellow with Oil Change International and a visiting scholar with the Institute for Policy Studies. Her articles and opinion pieces appear regularly in newspapers, magazines, and online outlets, including the International Herald Tribune, New York Times, and Los Angeles Times. <clears throat> she is author of The Bush Agenda, Invading the World One Economy at a Time, and the forthcoming The Tyranny of Oil, the World's Most Powerful Industry, and What We Must Do to Stop It. She is also a contributing author to Alternatives to Economic Globalization, A Better World is Possible, and A Game as Old as Empire, The Secret World of Economic Hitmen and the Web of Global Corruption. Antonia, um, we had a little bit of a late start, and uh, Louise just went a little bit over time, so I know we promised you Sorry. 25 minutes. Mm -hmm. That's okay. But uh, I know we promised you 25 minutes, but if you could uh, try and, and keep it down to 20, that would really help us out. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. I'm going to stand up. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being here, and I want to say uh, what an absolute honor it is to be here and to be with you and how grateful I am to Iraq Veterans Against the War for organizing this incredibly difficult and important and powerful event, so thank you. Um, and I am I'm deeply moved uh, uh, to be here, and the, the purpose of my testimony is to provide support to those uh, brave soldiers who are here, those who are standing up against the war, those who are resisting the war, those who are taking action about and against the war, and to provide testimony that supports that activity uh, and those positions. But also we were asked, uh, very critically, importantly, um, by the panel leader to make sure that we bring the lived experiences of Iraqis into this discussion and the impact on the ground of Iraqis. And I'm going to attempt um, to address both of those things in my testimony. With the point of the testimony being that the United States invasion of Iraq was an illegal act of war. It was unsupported by either international law, U.S. law, the U.S. military code of conduct, nor basic morality. In the execution of the war and the ongoing occupation, moreover, a clear pattern of war crimes and crimes against humanity have and are being committed. Soldiers, therefore, who refuse to fight, who stand up to the war, who speak out and act out against the war are not only morally right in their response, but legally required to take such measures. They are upholding their obligation to reject illegal orders and to defend the Constitution of the United States. I want to begin um, with a quick quote from Michael Schur. He was the CIA's former senior uh, lead expert on Al-Qaeda. He quit in protest of the actions taken by the Bush administration and has since written several critical books. Uh, I'm going to quote from one of those imperial hubris. The U.S. invasion of Iraq was not preemption. It was an avaricious, premeditated, unprovoked war against a foe who posed no immediate threat, but whose defeat did offer economic advantages. There are two areas in which I'm going to testify to of the illegality of the war. The first is the war's objective. The war's objective, there, there are certain areas, and I'm sure many of you could, could uh, articulate these even better than I can. The international law does substantiate for one, war, for one country initiating a war against another country. That list does not include seizure of another country's natural resources, nor does it include the hoped for political, economic, and hegemonic gain that gaining control of those resources would grant a nation. I certainly do not stand as a minority person at this point in stating uh, quite an obvious fact, which is at this, quite obvious at this point and, and said by uh, a far more prestigious people than myself that the war in Iraq was clearly a war launched and fought for and continued to be fought for, for oil. 
I think most famously now, Alan Greenspan, uh, the ultra-libertarian Republican conservative former head of the Federal Reserve, who said in his memoirs, I'm very saddened to say what everyone in Washington knows, which is that the war in Iraq is about oil. Now, some of you may have seen him retreat from those statements in the press after he made them in his memoir. That is because he was attacked from the right for saying the truth. Read his book. Actually, don't. It's 500 pages long. I read it. You don't need to read it. <laughs> in the chapter in which he makes this statement, it is very clear that what he is saying is intended to be said. It was, for him, a statement of a no-brainer. It is obvious that this war is about oil. And oil, though, is not just about corporations. It's not just about the corporations who are pillaging, the corporations who are reaping profits off of the war, although it is definitely about them, and I'll get to them. Oil is not just about the corporations who take hold of the oil. Oil is also about the power that having that oil grants to the hold E. The country and the people that control the oil deny it to others who want it. They dictate terms on which it can be acquired. They gain the denial of that oil and the power that could be granted to the other people who want to hold on to that oil. And it, gra it grants regional and global power to those who control the oil, which is something that the Bush administration was very frank in its intent well before taking office in the intent of the war. Okay. Um, the other side of the illegality of the war is the conduct of the war. And the testimony that we've heard so far from Kelly and Luis about the, the contractors and the manipulation of contractors, um, this was not a haphazard. This was not uh, something that, that just happened because of bad oversight or bad planning. The decision to turn the war over to U.S. corporations was part of the very extensive pre-planning for post-invasion Iraq, which did happen quite clearly as part of this war and this war planning. The Bush administration had very clear post-invasion plans. They were laid out, they were well articulated, and they have been followed. Those plans included the complete economic restructuring of the Iraqi economy to allow U.S. corporations in. And I, I, if I had time, I would quote uh, uh, from the companies, but I don't. They're clear, the company's clear stated intent to, one, stay put in Iraq because they saw it as a potential economic boom, and two, to see Iraq as a jumping off point from which they would gain access to the rest of the Middle East. And they state that quite clearly in their intentions. The Bush administration wrote out an economic plan that was then put in place. Now, why this plan was illegal and why it constitutes a crime against humanity is that the U.S. occupation of Iraq, the formal occupation which was acknowledged by the United Nations as a formal occupation, required certain commitments of the United States. Those commitments were that the United States would ensure that the basic services necessary for life in Iraq would be provided to Iraqi citizens. But it would be excluded from rewriting the basic laws of the nation. The Bush administration did exactly the opposite. It did not provide services, and it did completely rewrite the economic laws. Now, the impact of not providing the services, and I'll try and go into the, the details of that, are that today, while there are 2.2 million Iraqi refugees who have fled Iraq, 2.2 million who have left the country, that doesn't include the displaced, the United Nations actually does not suggest that those Iraqis return to Iraq. It suggests that they stay away. And the reason why it suggests that they say, stay away is not security, it's because there is no water, there is no electricity, there is no health care, there is no shelter, there are no roads, and it is not a safe place for Iraqis to be. And that does not just make it unsafe for Iraqis. So just a few days ago, um, in resp responding to a question, about what will happen if progress is not made on improving the quality of life for average Iraqis. 
Major General Mark Hurtling, Commander of U.S. Forces in Northern Iraq said, I'm going to see more soldiers hurt and killed and we are not going to be able to reduce the number of forces because there's going to be more people out there planting bombs and shooting people. Now, $50 billion in money was paid out to U.S. corporations, promised to U.S. corporations, it's important that it hasn't all been paid out, to do this work. The corporations that have received the most money are the Bechtel Corporation, Yes, Bechtel deserves a hiss, whoever did that. Uh, the Bechtel Corporation, Shaw, Perini, uh, the, the list goes on and on. There's 10 key U.S. contractors, Parsons. Halliburton received the largest money. Uh, they they have been promised about $20 billion, uh, which is, of course, an enormous sum. Uh, the rest of the sums look, look minuscule in comparison. Bechtel's is about $2.8 billion. Uh, Parsons is about 3.5. I'm not going to remember all these numbers. That money was, is, of course, an enormous quantity of money. The problem was that when these grants were given, first of all, Iraqis were, of course, overlooked. But not only were Iraqis overlooked, the entire structure of the economic uh, reconstruction laid in place the results that we're seeing now. So one of the first acts of the U.S occupation government led by Paul Bremer was called the debathification order. This was the order by which Bremer fired 120,000 of all of the key ministerial leaders in Iraq, all of the engineers, all of the scientists, all of the people who ran the water ministry, the electrical ministry, the oil ministry. He fired them all, 120,000 people. He fired them all because he didn't want anyone standing away in the way of the restructuring that was being planned. That left an enormous brain vacuum. The next step that Bremer did was then to fire 500,000 Iraqi soldiers. Wait, yes, half a million Iraqi soldiers. The US military had intended that those soldiers would be put to work to do the reconstruction. But the Bush administration's economic plan didn't include that. The Bush administration's economic plan was to bring in private contractors. So immediately from the get-go, you had half a million men with guns, made unemployed, without jobs, without money, and their families left without hope, without money. And some estimates put, it, put that number at 2.5 million Iraqis, 10% of the population, who from the get-go were now very, very hostile to the reconstruction and to the invasion, to the occupation. All of these people also knew that U.S. companies were being given billions of dollars to reconstruct the country. And you'll hear many people testify to the fact that there are many Iraqis who, while they were very upset that Iraqi companies, of which there were many, Iraqi workers, of which there were many, who were more than capable of doing the work, were being jumped over. But there was a sense that, well, if America is going to spend $10 billion fixing our electricity, that's not so bad, and, you know, maybe that'll be good. And there was a sense of allowing this to take place. The reconstruction failed, and one of the primary reasons why it failed was that the objective was not to just get the services up and running. The objective was this longer-term permanent presence, which I mentioned, so that you had companies like Bechtel spending the first six weeks in country, um, okay, uh, the first six weeks in country walking around doing an assessment of the situation. They could have talked to the Iraqis who ran the water systems. They could have hired the Iraqis to run the water systems, but they didn't. They walked around, they checked out the scene. In that time, there was no electricity. There was no water being provided. And that built up, of course, bad will. And then by the time Bechtel got to work, it became very unsafe for Bechtel to be at work. Um, the failure of the reconstruction continues, but one of the things that's important for us to, to uh, remain aware of today is that many of the companies that have uh, ra radically failed, so Bechtel, a recent report found that they completed less than half 
of the projects that they were contracted to fulfill, and that was water, electricity, schools, basic rebuilding. Parsons, another uh, analysis just done that Parsons had barely fulfilled any of its commitments. Of the statistic that Luis gave, Parsons was hired to rebuild 150 primary health centers across the country. They built 34, and not all of them are even functional. But not all of that money has been paid out, and that's an area where we can take action. Um, I just don't nearly have time to say the things that I had planned to say, so let me just say a couple things. Um, the first is the intention of the war to be about oil. Um, the, right now, we are in a situation where five oil companies, Exxon, Chevron, BP, Shell, and Total, have just signed, within the last week, contracts to get oil to go into Iraq. Anyone with any sense of Iraqi history recognizes the names of these companies. These are the exact same companies that, from the end of World War II until 1970, owned all of Iraq's oil. They were given it as a war bounty at the end of World War I. They owned it, they controlled it, and they controlled Iraq's fate because of owning the oil. Since they were kicked out in the early 1970s, they've been trying to get back in. This is the second or third and maybe the largest pot of oil in the world, depending on who's counting. The world is running out of oil. However, oil sells for $110 a barrel. This oil is sitting there like a gleaming prize at the end of the finishing line. And believe me, they have been planning and plotting to get it. These five contracts are the tip of the iceberg. The intent is to get the Iraqis to pass a law that would put everything back the way it was in the 20s, to take it from a nationalized oil system to a privatized oil system where U.S. oil companies, and a little bit for the French and a little bit for the British, because, you know, we like them, <laughs> would own and control the oil. Now, if that happens, a U.S. government report that was leaked by ABC News said that, and, and just so we are using the terminology, this is one of the, the president's benchmarks for Iraq, which the Congress adopted passage of an oil law in Iraq. Another one of the benchmarks, by the way, was reversing the debathification law that Bremer put into place that fired all of those experts. The oil law, if it is to be put in place, and if U.S. companies and the companies that are angling are Exxon, Chevron, Conoco, Marathon, BP, Shell, and Total, if they stay, they will need to be, quote, underwritten by the U.S. government. I take underwritten not by the U.S. government to mean you, to be underwritten by the U.S. military, that we will have to stay to ensure their safety and the continuation of their mission, which was the whole reason why we went there in the first place. Now, I'm supposed to wrap up. Let me say two things on hopefulness, because there was a lot of talk last night about um, where is the U.S. peace movement. In the last several months, and this is a reflection of the last several months and of the last several years, press coverage of Iraq has fallen precipitously, such that where it was 15% of coverage last year, it was 1%, 1% of mainstream media coverage in the last period of time that was measured. 1%. The average American at this point thinks that only 3,000 U.S. soldiers have died in Iraq. They don't know what's happening in Iraq. But we also don't know, unless we are listening and watching Democracy Now!, listening and watching KPFA, listening and watching Truth Out, that the peace movement is in fact alive and well and active. You just can't pick up your newspaper to see it. So for example, to address the problems that we're talking about right now, the corporate pillaging, this Saturday in San Francisco and in Richmond, California, Activists are going to be shutting down Chevron's refinery, where it's bringing in Iraqi oil. And they're going to shut it down for a day so that Chevron can't profit off of it, Iraqi, its Iraqi oil for one day. And they're going to surround the refinery by, by water, by land, by bike. We've shut down Chevron's headquarters. We've shut down Bechtel's headquarters such that Bechtel 
got so sick of being shut down every week in San Francisco that after 100 years of being based in San Francisco, they left town. And they have not, they have not re-upped after their deep commitment. They wanted to privatize Iraq's water. They wanted to privatize Iraq's electricity. They wanted to stay there. They have not re-upped their contracts. They have not stayed because it was not in their interest to do so. The answer to all of this is one, that there is activism and there needs to be more. Two, not that the US soldiers have to stay in Iraq to make sure that reconstruction happens. That's not what I'm saying. <laughs> that Iraqis are more than capable of doing this work and having this money turned over. And that the most important thing is for the occupation to end and all of the occupation to end, all of the contractors to leave, all of the companies to leave, all of the soldiers to leave, so that Iraqis can pick up the pieces for themselves. Thank you all very, very much. <laughs>